shall be holy, for I am holy. Since the beginning, God has set his people apart from the world. And yet holiness is so much more than what we do. It's what we're called to be. Because our God is holy, we shall be holy. We shall be set apart. Welcome everybody online, in the room. What a great moment of worship we just had. We shouldn't run past that too fast. God is here and cares for us deeply. Lord, we thank you for visiting us. Uh, we listen, we bring our series on holiness to a close today, but let me give you a quick snapshot of where we are going next, starting next week for the month of February. We'll be moving through a series we haven't looked at in a bit. It's called The Generous Gospel. Generous Gospel, four moments in the book of Acts. We'll be seeing how the early church grew through both grace and generosity, through both faith and finances. This is a big theme in the book of Acts, all right? But in case that makes you nervous, let me try that white mic there. I feel like I'm popping all good. No worries. Journey's pleasant, everybody. All right. Uh, yes. So don't worry, there's, there's no campaign associated with this, in case you were wondering. And for those of you for whom something about finances may be anxiety producing, let me tell you, my hope is to make this both really redemptive and super interesting, like you might learn something. All I have to say, I don't think you'll be bored, but to use a church word, I think you'll be blessed. Blessed. Some of you. You just came home when I said that right then. All right, blessed. Yes, Lord. All right, we've been in a series this month with our Every Nation family around the world, bringing it all to a close today. Week one, we looked at the reality, the fact that God, the God of the Bible, is holy. Last week, we looked at how God makes his people holy. And today, we conclude by seeing how God doesn't just make people holy, but one day, one day, he'll also make the planet holy. The planet holy. Our scripture reading today is from Revelation 21. And 22. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they've done. I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. That's the reading of God's word today. All his people said, amen. Amen. Yeah, Uh, in 1968, a man by the name of John Stephen Aquari, there he is today, uh, he represented Tanzania in the men's Olympic marathon, marathon runner. While jockeying for position during the race, he collided with some of the other runners and he fell to the ground and he severely gashed and dislocated his knee. Not good. Most people assumed, I would assume, that he would pull out of the race and go to the hospital. Instead, he chose to receive medical attention and he returned to the track. There's a shot of it. Even though 18 of the 75 runners had already quit the race because it was too long or too hard, he resolved to complete the event no matter what. And more than an hour after everybody else had finished and the medal ceremony had taken place and all the awards were given, 
Aquari finally finished <coughs> his race, cheered on by the remaining spectators in the stands. It was an amazing moment. And when the reporters asked why he didn't quit, he said this. He said, I never thought of stopping. Like, never. Why not? He said this. My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. Yeah, that's a showstopper. What a statement. I think he's telling us something about what it means to be human, which is this. When you run your race with the end in mind, you'll find you can finish. When you run your race with the end in mind, you'll find you can finish. It's true about sports. It's true about marriage. It's true about parenting, about work, about getting that diploma. When you can imagine what the finish line feels like, you can endure some pain in your present. Let me tell you right now, God, God did not create us just to start our race. He created us to finish our race. He didn't just create you to begin your life's purpose of being set apart for him. He created you to finish it, right? I mean, to the one who overcomes, God says, I'll give a wreath like a medal, the crown of life. Paul said this, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me. So what can help us do that? Not just to start our race of being set apart for God's purpose, what can help us finish it? Well, what can help us finish it is what the book of Revelation has given each generation of Christian believers. It's this. It's a vision of holiness completed. Holiness completed. It's a, a finish line of sorts. Revelation gives us a vision of the future, which can help us handle our now. It was written to first century Christians, and the book shows God's progressive victory over evil, over pain, his total victory even over suffering. Well, how does that happen? How is holiness completed? How will God restore all things? Well, Revelation 21 and 22, we're going to look at it and say, it's not how you might think. It's not how you might think. It's actually through the introduction of three tensions here in the text. Three tensions in the text we're going to look at and see how and why holiness is completed. How the world's going to be made right. Let's see these three tensions today. It's going to be through, number one, through a new city, which is everywhere. Number two, a new future, which is now. And through a new judgment, which is mercy. So let's take a look at the finish line. Hmm? and see how that helps us run our race right now. Here we go. Holiness is completed through number one, through a new city, which is everywhere. Let's begin here in 21.1. Notice what John the Revelator says. The future, God's future will be like. He said it's a new heaven, a new earth filled with something in specific. He said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. He's picking up the prophet Isaiah. For the first heaven... And the first earth, that's us now, had passed away and there was no longer any sea. That's a reference to danger or threats. There's no more threats. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So notice here what the future is. It's not just any city, but it's what kind of city? Come on. A holy city. The holy city. And it's not just a nameless place. It's a named city, the new Jerusalem, which means literally the foundation of peace. So one day this is saying there's a holy city that'll fill the whole world with a forever kind of peace. Well, why? Why? Why is this? Why out of all things is a holy city the chosen future of our God? Why that? Well, Think about it. What did, what did a city mean in ancient times? Let's ask what it would have meant to these folks. What did it mean to them? Well, a city back then was three things. Number one, a city was a place of safety. It was a place of safety. If you lived in a city, cities typically had what? Come on, what did Proverbs tell you? Walls, right? Fortified walls, strong towers, walls, towers protected you from what? Like the elements, the wind, uh, from invaders, marauders. Food and water were delivered to where? To cities, yeah. But a city wasn't just a place of safety. Second, it was a place of significance. 
of significance. The city was where skilled workers lived. Religious and teachers, workers and teachers lived. Scholars lived in especially powerful cities. They became known as the center of their own empire. Powerful cities were the, the thing on which a, a ruler hung his hat. Come on, Nebuchadnezzar hung his hat on Babylon. Caesar hung his hat on Rome. They were both cities from which kings ruled. Kings ruled from the city, not from the country. And it's still the same today in a lot of ways. Cities, especially certain cities, are still places of significance. After all, come on, what does the saying say? How does the saying go? If you can make it in New York, you can make it where? Anywhere. Speaking of New York, see what I just did there? A few years ago, Carrie and I went there. Uh, for a weekend getaway, and our flight landed, and we went immediately to a Broadway show. It was amazing. Uh, We got to our seats, we sat down, and the lady next to me, uh, she was an older Jewish woman, fabulously wealthy, dripping with immaculate jewelry. It was spectacular. She had no, shall we say, inhibitions towards meeting strangers and initiating conversations. She started peppering me with questions and asking me, you know, who I was, where I was from, what I did. And slowly but surely, as I answered her questions, my life came out like a total stereotype. Total stereotype. (laughs) I was married. How many kids? Not one, not two. Four. I was a Christian pastor. My kids at the time were all homeschooled. We were from Texas. And with each answer, I kid you not, I could sense her estimation of me (laughs) as a human being begin to drop. (laughs) Then, but then she asked, well, where in Texas? And I said, well, we live in Austin. And that changed everything. (laughs) She said, said, Austin, oh, that's not like the rest of Texas, right? (laughs) One of her daughters, she said, had moved to Austin and loved it. She said she was in Hollywood. Now she's in Austin. She likes it better there. Austin, see, was cool. Therefore, I was too. I wasn't from someplace like Dallas. You know, Houston. Yeah, yeah. Abilene. Yeah, yeah. Sensing that, true story, I seized the moment and I shared my entire Christian conversion with her. Oh, sorry, testimony. The whole thing, meeting Jesus as a freshman in college through a prophecy, God prophesied over me, God saved, a miracle healing in my body, the whole bit, all of that. And when I was done, she just sat and stared at me. Like that was way more than she had bargained for. She probably was sorry she even started the conversation. Then she paused. She turned to her Jewish lady friend she had come with on her left, and she said in her classic Jewish New York voice, he said he's a pastor. To which this little sort of shrunken lady next to her, without looking up from her program, said, oh. (laughs) That's it. Oh. (laughs) We were seeing the show Amazing Grace. Great story, great great show. All about John Newton, the slave trader, and his Christian conversion, and all of that. And at the end, the cast all comes out of the stage, and the conclusion is they all sing the famous hymn. Lead the audience in a singing of Amazing Grace. And in the middle of it, we're all standing. She leans over. She grabs my arm. Now she's touching me, you see. And she said, you should get them to come sing in your church. I bet, I bet your church would love them. Love them. I bet they would. Afterward, I tell Carrie this story. She's like, what the heck? What's going on? She said, okay, only you could take me to New York on a vacation. And with five hours of landing, you start witnessing to a Jewish lady in a Broadway theater. I said, all right, you know, you love me. Well, again, what had happened, (laughs) the city, Austin, was significant, at least in her mind, and therefore I was too. Let's put it together. Cities were places of safety and significance. Another way of putting that would be cities were places of salvation, of salvation. The place where the needs of the soul were met. Temples were built where? Come on. Cities, libraries built where? Cities. So if you're God and Caesar hung his hat on Rome, Nebuchadnezzar hung his hat on Babylon, where would you hang your divine hat? What's the sign of your immense power, your loving goodness, your care for your people? Oh, not just Jerusalem, but a new Jerusalem, 
unlike any city ever seen. And one that fills not just a whole country, but the whole world with a foundation of peace. You'd make that place the centerpiece of your kingdom. And in doing so, you'd make the whole world a place of eternal safety. Give every citizen eternal significance and grant to every person who lived there salvation filled with the needs, what meets the needs of every soul. See, the unholiness, you'd see, the unholiness of the city of man gone. The holiness of the city of God forever present. That's the finish line, number one. So when will that future arrive? When does it get here? When does the city come down? It's through a second tension we're shown here. Number two, there's a new future. Oh, which is now as in the city will arrive. But here's the tension. It's already here. It's already here. It will arrive in full, but it's here in part now. The future arrives not yet, but also Today, how can this be? Oh, remember what Jesus said. Come on, he said, my people, my people are what? Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, are a city set on a hill. You're a city set on a hill. My people, he says, are already like a, a city in a small way. Book of Hebrews says this, chapter 12. He says, but you have come, past tense, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Where's that? The heavenly Jerusalem. Oh, the new Jerusalem's already here in a small way, whenever, wherever God's people gather. Revelation 21, Jesus said this, which we read. He said, I am making everything new. When? Not then, not in the past, right now. How does that happen? Well, it happens now as the people of God live like they will then, like they will then. So how do we do that? How do we live as citizens, not just of Austin or Texas or the States, but as citizens of the new Jerusalem. How do we live as citizens of the city of forever peace? Well, there's so much here in this chapter. I will restrain myself, but let me just give you one way. Look at verse uh, chapter 22, verse four. It says this, here's how they live. Here's how citizens lived in. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Well, this is a specific reference to the Old Testament. You may get this. Where the high priest, the one who led the people in worship, who could go into God's holy place one time a year, that's all, on Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, he would have the name of Yahweh written on his forehead. This is saying that every person in that city gets to worship like that guy. Like that guy. That guy, that priest, got to experience the face the panim, the Hebrew word, the panim, the presence of God. And because we are now priests, remember last week you were here for this, yes? We saw last week because we're priests, when we authentically worship, you felt this this morning, did we not? It brings the heavenly city into our city. It brings safety. It brings a sense of significance. It even can bring salvation. Many years ago, and Carrie and I were living in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, yes. We attended a multi-ethnic church, great one. And that church, like us, like every other multi-ethnic church, wrestled over how to lead its people and create a, a worship gathering and a, a, that would connect with a diverse group of hearts and lives and stories. And this church majored in types of songs and expressions I was not accustomed to and that were not my preference, shall we say. And so one Sunday... I decided after being there for a while, I had enough. I was tired of the way that worship leader led. After all, I had been playing in bands for years. I was an expert, you see. I was tired of the way some of the folks were acting in worship. Tired of the songs they chose. And so one Sunday, it all broke. The band played some really old school gospel song where they clap on the beats Two and four for some of you. I'm informing you now. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Oh, yeah. Not the one and the three like rock songs typically go. Some of you know what I mean. That's why you struggle to clap when we do the gospel stuff. You look a little funny. Your neighbor's like, they ain't from around here. Yeah. It's literally a new way of worship for your human body. And so anyway, that Sunday, the band was playing this old school gospel song. And I was totally not connecting. I rolling it on the inside. No one here has ever done this. I can feel myself getting angry. And then this teenage African-American male 
began dancing and spinning down the aisle, coming toward the front. Other people in the crowd began to cheer and applaud. Some of them even started to cry and to weep. And all of this was so strange and even almost offensive to me. I left that day thinking, I don't know what to do. So I brought my complaint to one of the elders there at the church. And I went into his office and I said, what kind of songs are we doing? They don't connect with me or people like me. See, I'm looking out for them. Right, right. And what's up with the guy doing the whirly bird down front? Hmm? What's up with him? I was getting worked out. I was getting kind of angry about it. You know what he told me? Here's what he said. It was unforgettable. He was so kind. He was so patient. My immaturity. He said that young man's father's name, father's name was James. James had been a faithful servant at that church for like 20 years, opening doors, greeting people in the parking lot, all of that. And last week, he dropped dead of a heart attack. Yeah. His family had really been going through it. The young man that you saw had been resisting God, was kind of been far from God, wasn't serving God. And the song they played was his father's favorite worship song. They played it to honor him, knowing his family would be there that day. Did you know that? He asked me. I said, no, I didn't know that. And he said, when he heard his father's favorite song, his heart broke free, broke free. And that moment when you saw him dancing and spinning and crying was the very moment he decided to fully surrender his life to Jesus in that place. And the people who were cheering were the people who knew what was going on. And to see him surrender his heart to Christ like that, move their hearts to worship. And he looked at me and he said, very gently, very gently, he says, that young man whose faithful father passed away just got saved in the middle of the song you hated. And of course, I felt super ashamed. I remember thinking, God, forgive me for, for judging. Forgive me for judging. And I learned a lesson that day. Here it is. Worship isn't about you or what you want. It's primarily, first, about God and what he wants. What he wants. And what does he want? Your heart. Your heart. Your full heart. Seeking his face, his panim, his presence. Like that young man's heart. Let me ask, will you, will you give it to him? Hmm? hard today, maybe. In a church like Mosaic, by the way, sometimes it'll be here the song you like. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes it's a style you like. Sometimes it isn't. Listen, let me tell you a little secret here. I know a guy on the worship team, and I don't always get the song or style I kind of want to hear either. You know what? Because if it were up to me, here's what we do. We do something like this. Daft Punk meets U2 meets Bach meets John Coltrane, meets Otis Redding. I think that would be awesome, right? I mean, like electronic, jazzy, classical rock soul. Amazing. Maybe we should invent that, right? But again, worship isn't about me. It's about God. When I'm here, I'm here for his panim, his face, his presence, the face of God. And by the way, one day when we worship in that city, the heavenly Jerusalem, it's not going to be the song or style or even language that you like either. It will be worship in all styles, languages from every tribe and tongue. So when we do something here that's just a little different for you, consider it practice for eternity. Practice for eternity. Amen. Yeah. And worship, worship like a priest. Now, it brings the future city here bit by bit by bit. Holiness then. Completed number one through a new city, which everywhere. Number two through a, a future, which is now. And most of all, most of all, through a new judgment. But there's mercy. Judgment, which is mercy. Look at this verse. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. This is saying you can't even get into the city, the New Jerusalem, unless you're following a certain kind of dress code, unless your robes have been washed. And one of the most startling features of Revelation is what this hints at, which is that this. This is often as Revelation talks about the end of evil, God's victory over suffering, just as often, even simultaneously, it's also talking about coming judgment. And you see it here in this verse, which basically tells you again that those who have not repented of their sin, have not placed their trust in Jesus, do not get in. They don't go into the city unless they have their robes washed, that is, they trade their unholiness for his holiness. Unless that happens, you can't get in. 
past the gates. And over the years, many people have had a real issue with this. And maybe this is you right now. You're like, oh God, where did this come from? The objection goes like this. How can the threat of coming judgment do anything but make me afraid? And if Christianity is like just a fear-based kind of thing, I don't want any part of that. So is that what this is? Is the Christian faith just a fear-based threat? God hanging something over your head to get you to cower and behave a little better right now. Is that what this is? I, I want to suggest to you that the judgment of God, if you'll see it rightly, is not only the most merciful thing God could bring into the world, but the most loving thing he could bring into your life right now. A woman by the name of Shanti Felden. Shanti Felden is a Christian author and researcher, writes a lot about marriage. And she tells a story about how she and her husband, once upon a time, were really going through it in their marriage. It wasn't going good. And her birthday was coming up. So her husband thought he would do something. He thought it would be a good idea to try to do something nice for her. And so starting a year ahead of time, he decided he was going to keep a journal record of their relationship. And the goal was to give it to her on her birthday in about a year to show her he'd been thinking about her and how he had loved her over time. And it all started out fine until one day they got in a really big fight. Yeah. And that night when he went to go write in his secret birthday journal on the computer, he debated whether or not to include it. But he thought, you know what? I'm an honest guy. I want to be honest. (laughs) So he wrote down how awful she had been to him and how hard it was to be married to her. But the next day, as he thought about what he had written, he went back and he looked at it and he noticed, which he hadn't noticed before, how mean and rude and awful he sounded. And so he decided to add an addendum, something like, well, you know, and I know you're always so faithful to me and you're good to our family and I know you love me even though you acted like this. And so he kept on with the journal. And when he came to the next time he got in a fight with her, he started to write down again how awful she had been to him. But this time, instead of waiting till the next day to see his faults and issues and attitudes, he rewrote how he was feeling in the moment. And he started to act a little differently. And then after that, he noticed something unusual would happen. He noticed whenever he and Shanti would begin to argue, he began to think of the journal he'd have to write in that night. And now he was going to have to face the journal. Instead, he began to course correct, even in the middle of their arguing and knowing he was going to have to face the record of how he had also behaved, caused him to be more kind, more loving, more gracious, a better husband, father, and friend. And Shanti Felden credits that journal with saving their marriage. She said she had no idea that was going on, no idea what, what he was doing, but she said she could tell he was changing like right in front of her eyes. Why? Why? Well, it's because in a small way, (laughs) the threat of coming judgment he had to face changed him. It changed him. That journal, the record of his choices and behaviors, the record of how he has behaved caused him to change now. And in that light, knowing he would face future judgment, that was the most loving thing hmm, he could have experienced. Now imagine if you really knew and believed that one day you would face that on an infinite scale, what would that do to you? Hmm? That record, I think knowing that exists, because it does, would change how you lived right now. And that's what the Christian doctrine of final judgment is. It is merciful in that God's judgment will end evil and it's loving in the sense that it changes you into a better person right now. But here's the miracle and the twist. The miracle and twist is this. No one can pass God's judgment on their own record. Can't do it. But yet, in a sense, anyone can. No one can pass, but anyone can pass. No one can pass his judgment, but anyone can receive mercy. How? It's because of the one who left the heavenly city. And he came into our earthly city. Jesus Christ entered our city, the city of man. He came to his own. He was the best citizen any nation could want. He only loved. He only fed. He only healed. He only taught, clothed, fed, served. But for all of that, he received the worst of what the city of man had to offer. He shed his own tears over our city. He got death. He knows what it's like to lose a father, a friend. He was mocked and cast out of the city and crucified where? 
outside the city, a place not of significance, but of shame, of shame. He got the curse so we could get the blessing so that we could have our robes washed and pass through into that place. And to wash our robes means, here's what you say, it means I'm not good enough to make it on my own. My record won't stand. Come on, I cannot pass the judgment, but there is one who took my place and stood in the place of judgment for me so that I could receive mercy, go free, and pass through. And when you see this is what Jesus has done for you, and you say, oh, wash me, not just my head like Peter, not just my feet, but my head, my hands, my whole self. When you refuse to say, you can pass the judgment on your own now. Now we receive mercy. We can go in. Let me take a moment and pray for us. I hope in light of this, even some of us would say yes to him for the first time today. Lord, we come in Jesus' name and we thank you for what you show us here. What a place that will transform this world. That transforms it bit by bit now and how we can be a part of it. Lord, would you give us now the courage and honesty to take, as it's been said, a a fearless moral inventory and to see we cannot pass on our own. Our record can't stand, but there is one whose record can. Jesus, it's yours. We lean on that and trust that today I'm praying that a person would leave without saying yes to Jesus today. In your name I pray these things, amen.